If you've traveled in many different cities in America, you may have used some of public transit. Perhaps a bus, perhaps commuter rail, perhaps light rail, but what's the difference between all that stuff anyways, and what does light rail mean? It's a term that has gotten condensed down over the years, and a lot of folks seem to have issues with the definition and just what it plainly says, light rail. I had a friend recently chatting with me and assumed that light rail uses light rails, that the physical rails that light rail trains operate on are small or lightweight. Recall that there's different weights of rail that exist. Uh, and I got to tell him, no, the system that I worked with and helped design in Seattle uses 136 pound per yard rail, which is pretty much the same as the standard that the class ones use for hauling freight. And so people might say, oh, light rail and heavy rail to distinguish between light rail and then heavy rail, but the rail itself is all the same weight. It varies by the system, of course, but let's get a little bit into what light rail is and a little bit about rails themselves and all those fun nuances today. So first and foremost, light rail is the shortened version of what the real definition is, which is light rail transit, which means that the vehicles are the specific part of it that become light versus something that is heavy rail or more commuter rail style, which is a traditional train versus light rail vehicles. And it's specifically the type of vehicle that is operating in the system that makes it light rail. It has nothing to do with the weight of the rail whatsoever, despite our common shortening of the term to light rail. These days, light rail can be used to describe a number of different systems that all have slightly different operating characteristics. And it's a pretty generalized term, which is part of the reason why some of these definitions and the confusion exist. Originally, when the term was defined in the early 60s, it meant that the cars had more capacity than a traditional streetcar, like you may still see in cities like San Francisco, and that they appear like a train. They've got multiple units attached at once, rather than just one individual car and that those cars have multiple extra sets of doors versus just one in the middle or one on each end such that people can get in and out more easily and that they run more quickly and more quietly in terms of operation. And that is true of pretty much all light rail systems I can personally think of. But even then that doesn't seem to explain the true definition of the system. And, and what it really means to be light rail versus commuter rail versus a streetcar or something like that. The way that I see it is that a streetcar is something that runs along the street exclusively. It always runs in with cars, pedestrians, everything through a non-exclusive right of way, which means that it's shared and everyone runs in the same space, perhaps down the center of a street or in one of the vehicle travel lanes, that sort of thing. Uh, and typically streetcars are always what's called a low floor vehicle, which means that the floor is easily stepped up and into with either no platform or a very short platform or curb height type platform. Think of getting on a normal city bus. It's kind of like that. Whereas light rail, the light rail vehicles might be low floor vehicles, but they also might be raised floor with a stairwell. And uh, I know that there's plenty of transit nerds out there, and they're also some of the most opinionated, uh, desiring the perfection type people I've ever heard of. So I'm sure that we're going to hear a little bit about low floor vehicles and level boarding and all that sort of stuff in the comments, but know that that's not technically a requirement for light rail transit. Light rail is usually in its own exclusive alignment, but it can also have street running sections. Uh, Sound Transit, where I used to work, our light rail system had a couple sections that were at grade running through a street, and that causes a lot of challenges in operational schema because you're having what is a small, lightweight train at the end of the day operate and follow street lights. Yes, they're separate signals for the light rail vehicles themselves, but they're synced up with the traffic lights, and so you're going when the traffic lights and the city traffic controller tells you to. And with motorists being motorists and sometimes not being the best, 
that's a whole nother topic. Uh, th there can be quite a few different challenges, and they tend to be the more dangerous sections uh, because there are so many more variables. Versus an exclusive alignment, you get to control everything. You get to control access, have fences, the, all that sort of stuff, and you have a lot less chance for uh, incursions into the right-of-way, be it via a car or a pedestrian, that sort of thing. From a streetcar to a light rail vehicle setup, usually you're going from one individual car that can only run within city streets, you know, barring a couple little exceptions, to something that's typically more on an exclusive right of way with multiple different cars and typically can run much faster. A lot of systems do 55 plus miles an hour as their top speed command, and uh, at some point we should get into light rail transit signaling specifically because there's a lot of fascinating cool stuff that goes into that that is totally separate from the way that commuter rail and, and full size, full weight trains operate. And uh, I'd be happy to share that. So let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to get into speed commands and uh, TWC and all that sort of fun stuff. From light rail to commuter rail, which a lot of people call heavy rail, but that's not really a term that exists truly. Commuter rail is talking about something that is considered a full-size train and is regulated by the FRA and may very well be part of the general railway network. Sometimes it isn't. Um, here in Denver, we have RTD, the Regional Transportation District, and they have separate commuter lines that are right next to freight rail corridors, but I don't think there's any interconnection of the tracks for the sake of the electronic propulsion system and overhead contact and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they share the right-of-way, basically. It looks like a triple-track main, and two of it's RTD and one's BNSF, that kind of thing. Um, so they're not necessarily a part of the general system, but they're running right there. They're regulated by the FRA versus being regulated by the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, which light rail and uh, streetcars typically are. There's probably some setup where light rail ends up being regulated partially by the FRA. I would not be surprised, but to my knowledge, it's always the FTA instead. So there's different standards, different regulations, the whole nine yards. Um, but the vehicles that operate on commuter rail might very well look still kind of like a light rail vehicle or a subway kind of car, right? But they're bigger and they're more set up like a typical train with typical railway controls, railway signaling, and you typically lack certain things like speed commands or TWC systems like light rail has. There's also usually a different setup in terms of what we call headway. Headway is the time between trains. It's the frequency you see a train at the platform. In light rail, you're kind of designed to have trains all the time for most of the day, and you want to have very high availability of the service to make it convenient. You don't need to really know the schedule. You can turn up at the platform and there'll be a train within, you know, five minutes during peak times in some systems. Some systems go crazy if you're in New York or places like that. Oh my goodness, some of the, the crazy transit systems out there have trains every 60 to 90 seconds, and it's mind-boggling the engineering that goes into making that happen. But light rail is kind of about that frequency and lots of trains as much as you can, and being, you know, available all day, whereas commuter rail may not be available all day, and is typically a much longer headway between trains, 30 minutes maybe, or maybe even more depending on the system and how much equipment they have. Some places have a ton of trains that are commuter rail. Chicago and Metra, I mean, they have hundreds of locomotives and hundreds of trains that operate every day. It's mind boggling versus places like Denver here with RTD. The vehicles, they look more like a subway car than a full size train, but they're still a, a train by rule and authority. And the trains are once here and there and they don't have near as many that operate. Uh, in Seattle with Sound Transit, where I worked and where we were dealing with PTC and working on the locomotives and everything, I think we had 14 different locomotives and a bunch of cab cars and we ran bi-level passenger trains. On the south end, they were seven car long and we ran on the BNSF. 
if we were actually run by BNSF crews uh, that got to bid on to the passenger commuter jobs and there'd be trains north in the morning up to Seattle and trains south in the evening with a couple extra flip trains that ran opposite for other folks. But the bulk of the thing was commute to the city in the morning, come back in the evening. And there was decent headway between trains during the commuter times, but during the day, the trains didn't really run. So that's kind of the difference between commuter rail versus light rail. They're all kind of in this own thing, and, and you'll find systems that kind of blur all of these different lines. Uh, some places like Houston, they have light rail that is almost entirely still similar to a streetcar in that it runs through all the city streets almost entirely. I don't know if they have separate alignment. They might. I'm not super familiar with the system, but you'll find all sorts of different design parameters that kind of blur the lines there, and it's and it's quite interesting. Now, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, and uh, this is probably worth its own video, but I figured I'd cover a little bit here because I mentioned light rail doesn't mean that the rail is light. It means that it uses light rail vehicles, right? Weights of rail is a thing, have been a thing for since the inception of trains, basically. And in a true Americans will use anything but the metric system moment, it is measured in pounds per yard. So for every three feet of rail, however much that weighs is the classification of the rail. Uh, most modern class ones use 115 pound to 136 pound rail. So for every three feet, 136 pounds, 115 or 136 being kind of the most common. There's a bunch of other weights. And as you go back through history, some of the weights of rail were itty bitty, even on standard gauge or class one type railroads. Uh, a lot of the Rio Grande system back in the day in the narrow gauge uh, even when the K-37s were running was 45 or 50 pounds per yard. So very, very small and the rails much smaller and uh, meant that re-railing was a lot easier because you didn't have to hoist the train up even further. But uh, weight of rail is an entire whole conversation. And uh, let me know if you'd like to see that because we could get into all sorts of fun nuanced details about how you transition between the different types and weights and all the different components that go into that and, and how you determine what weight is right for a train. It all adds up. But the point is light rail, as some might assume, has nothing to do with the rail. It has everything to do with the trains. So hopefully this helped clear some things up. Hopefully you found it interesting. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, leave them down below. And thank you so much for watching.